It is time to take another look at what is happening in amateur radio and communications in general with the latest edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. We are North America's premier source for amateur radio news for the past 23 years, and we are looking forward to beginning our 24th year in January 2023. So without further ado, here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,240 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The FCC grants an ARRL waiver request that will allow amateurs to participate in the upcoming cross-band Pearl Harbor Day special event with the military. If you live in the UK, be on the lookout for counterfeit ICOM radios. We will have the details for you. The Japanese Omotenashi amateur radio mission to the moon is lost. The Museum of Information Explosion will feature an amateur radio station soon as it is the recipient of the final ARDC grant for 2022. The Quarter Century Wireless Association celebrates its 75th anniversary. Switzerland is the next country to shut down analog FM broadcasting in favor of DAB+. Amateurs in Australia are first with PTOTA, or Public Transportation on the Air Operations. In the UK, Ofcom grants extended access for experimental operations. We will have the details. And with satellite radio and tons of streaming options, what are the latest trends in car radio? Besides amateur radio, that is. They were revealed at the latest Digital Audio Broadcasting Summit, and we will have all the details for you in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about using a virtual private network, or VPN. The FCC is finally tackling robocalls. And he'll talk about how you can have a message displayed on the iPad aboard the Artemis Orion spacecraft. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, how low can you go? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill has more information on the great VHF frequency battles of the 1940s. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, keeps his feet on the ground this week. As the holidays approach, Greg is taking a trip on the train and will tell us the best ways to operate and monitor while aboard a train in the first of a new four-part series. And we will have our second amateur radio Christmas segment as we work our way to our annual Christmas Eve special program. That's all straight ahead, as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, and sitting in for Don K2ATJ, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Reporting from just outside the capital of New York State in Albany, New York, here in Glenmont, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio, where the calendar tells me it's December, but the weather is telling me it's spring. And reporting from a cold and drizzly Troy, New York news bureau, I'm Eric. KD2, RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where the shortest day of the year is quickly approaching, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And I'm Shannon Radigan, N0, JAM, No Jam, reporting from our Bureau in Central Florida. And reporting from our radio station atop the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. With the Thanksgiving leftover locker is... <laughs> Exuding leftovers at a frantic pace. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. We have some late-breaking news to start out this week's newscast, and to bring us that story, here is John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from League Headquarters. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. First up, a developing story into audio news. At the request of ARRL, the FCC has granted a waiver that will allow amateur radio operators to participate in the 81st commemoration of Pearl Harbor Day. 
On December 6th and 7th, amateurs can make crossband contacts with the battleship Iowa, now moored in California, using the NEPM call sign. The FCC waiver specifically allows participating amateur stations to monitor three federal frequencies, 14.375 MHz, 18.170 MHz, and 21.460 MHz. Responding on spectrum allocated to the amateur service and only at the request of event organizers. Operation consistent with the privileges of their amateur radio licenses and limiting communications to the period beginning at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, December 6th, 2022, through 8.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, December 7th, 2022. Because this is a cross-band operation, participating amateur stations are reminded to monitor their transmit frequency as well as the ship's station's out-of-band frequency to protect against inadvertently interfering with other amateur communications. We'll have more on this story as it develops on ARRL.org. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Colin Butler, writing in ICQpodcast.com, says ICOM has reported seeing counterfeit copies of ICOM radios available online, with some also arriving in the United Kingdom to unsuspecting buyers. These copies look like genuine ICOM radios, but when examined more closely are not, and significantly inferior in both quality and performance. Several buyers have contacted ICOM believing they have purchased and thought they were receiving a genuine ICOM. On arrival, the radios had an incorrect United Kingdom channel set, some channels missing, and in some cases, buttons not functioning as expected. Most, if not all, of these counterfeit products are found online and, compared to genuine, are priced incredibly low. However, what might seem like a bargain or a great purchase will become a disappointment and could affect how you use your radio and also you and others' safety. If you are unsure, ask the seller for a serial number in advance of purchasing, then call the ICOM customer service team who could confirm the origin of the radio as genuine or not. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency Ham Radio Club is reporting that Project Omotenashi, an amateur radio mission to the moon, is lost and not operating. Controllers were not able to receive radio communication from Omotenashi as of November 21, 2022. Omotenashi, technically known as Outstanding Moon Exploration Technologies, demonstrated by Nano Semi-Hard Impactor, was a small two-part spacecraft on board NASA's Artemis I mission. The mission carried the promise of putting amateur radio on the moon's surface when it launched on November 16th from Kennedy Space Center in the U.S. The payload contained an orbiting module and a surface probe. After landing on the surface of the moon, it was going to transmit a beacon in the amateur 70-centimeter band UHF at 437.41 MHz, while the orbiting module transmitted digital telemetry on UHF at 437.41 MHz. The website reports that data from Omotenashi will be analyzed to unearth a possible cause of what happened. The report said that the team believed that the axis of rotation is stable and that the spacecraft will get sunlight when the direction of the sun changes. They expect that will happen next March. Engineers will continue to investigate the cause of the incident and proceed with future operation plans while consulting with mission managers. JAXA Ham Radio Club reports, We were very encouraged by the warm support we received as a team. It's such a shame that it can't live up to expectations. Although we were not able to land on the moon, the opportunity to travel beyond the moon is valuable, so we would like to continue working on recovery and realize some of our mission. Amateur radio operators can continue to listen for the orbiting module downlink. Project updates are periodically posted at www.isas.jaxa.jp. Again, that's www. Dot .isas.jaxa.jp dot dot The final ARDC grant for 2022 will fund a modern amateur radio station for the museum that will feature digital technology. When it opens for visitors in early 2023, the Museum of Information Explosion in Huntsville, Alabama will feature a modern amateur radio station designed to educate visitors about the hobby. 
The station will present an interesting contrast between modern digital technology and the historic and classic gear found in a museum's other exhibits. The juxtaposition of old and new will illustrate the accelerating evolution of amateur radio and will demonstrate that ham radio is not an archaic and dying activity. This station will be staffed and maintained by members of local amateur radio clubs, including the Radio Club of the Museum of Information Explosion, who will install and operate the equipment and will serve as docents for the station. Licensed amateurs can use the station to try out new modes and techniques without making a major financial commitment and specialized tools and test equipment will be available to use on site. The Museum of Information Explosion will allow people to explore the history of communication and computing innovation and how these technologies have shaped our modern way of life. In addition to the amateur radio station, exhibits include vintage telegraph sets, phonographs, radios, and televisions. Multimedia presentations will bring the stories of yesterday to life and interactive, argumented, and virtual reality experiences will ignite the imagination of young adventurers. Every guest will leave with a deeper appreciation of the history of information technology. For more information on the museum, visit mie-hsv.org. For more information about the Radio Club of the Museum of Information Explosion, contact Chuck Lewis, N4NM, at the following address, C. Lewis at K-N-O-L-O-G-Y dot net. That's C. Lewis at Nology dot net. ARDC, or Amateur Radio Digital Communication, is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communication. The organization got its start by managing AMPR net address space, which is reserved for licensed amateur radio operators worldwide. Additionally, ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science. Such experimentation has led to advances that benefit the general public, including the mobile phone and wireless internet technology. ARDC envisions a world where all such technology is available through open source hardware and software, and where anyone who has the ability to innovate upon it. To learn more about ARDC, go to www.ampr.org. The Quarter Century Wireless Association, known as QCWA, will celebrate its 75th anniversary on December 5th, 2022. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with more in this report from League Headquarters. Founded in 1947, QCWA's mission includes promoting friendship and cooperation among amateur radio wireless operators who were licensed as such at least a quarter of a century ago. Today, QCWA has 230 chapters in the United States. And during the organization's 75 years, it has had nearly 40,000 members. The Cleveland, Ohio chapter was the first chapter chartered in 1951 and now has over 100 members. And to celebrate its 75th anniversary, the QCWA members only special event station, W2MM, will operate from 001 Universal Coordinated Time, December 3rd, to 2359 Universal Coordinated Time, December 10th, 2022. To learn more about the QCWA, check their website at qcwa.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. QCWA is also hosting the Members Only Worked 7575 Members Contest from December 5th, 2022 through February 18th, 2023. The contest encourages QCWA members to contact a minimum of 75 QCWA members during the contest period. All contest entrants will receive a special certificate, and additional information is available at qcwa.org. On December 1st, 2022, Youth on the Air, or YOTA, begins a month-long special event to celebrate young amateur radio operators, YOTA Month 2022. YOTA amateur radio operators aged 25 and younger will be on all bands using all modes throughout the month to make contacts around the world. In 2021, YOTA participants worldwide made 119,516 contacts, surpassing their goal of 100,000 contacts. In the United States, the call signs for the event will be K8Y, K8O, K8T, and K8A, 
Argentina will be active as LR1YOTA, Canada as VC3YOTA and VB7YOTA, El Salvador as YS1YOTA, and Honduras as HQ2YOTA. Amateur radio operators are encouraged to listen for and contact these stations, as well as call signs ending in the letters YOTA across the globe. In addition to the month-long celebration, on December 30th, from 1200 to 2359 UTC, round three of the YOTA contest will be active. Various YOTA activities and events are organized throughout the world. The IARU Youth and Amateur Radio webpage includes additional information and links at www.iaru.org. Aussie amateurs are the first with public transportation on the air event. You can trade the trails of the treetops for trains and trams thanks to an award program from the School Amateur Radio Club Network, VK3SRC. It's called Public Transport on the Air, pronounced P-T-O-T-A, and it encourages students and other commuters to grab their handhelds and call CQ while en route to their destination on some means of public transportation. Contacts can be made via digital or analog voice modes and can utilize any network or device. The only requirement is to have a QSO on the amateur band. Based in Australia, the club network unites schools in which students belong to an amateur radio club. The clubs are promoted and assisted by Julie, VK3FOWL, and Joe, VK3YSP. The school amateur radio club network administers a number of program awards, including PTOTA. PTOTA awards are issued as annual certificates. Participants' points are reset every January 1st of the year. The School Amateur Radio Network encourages students to make ham radio visible to the public in this way, but does offer two important caveats. Before leaving the train or tram, check your seat for any equipment you may have left behind. And perhaps, most importantly, Try to avoid morning and afternoon rush hour. Additional details are available at sarcnet.org. According to an article in Radio World magazine, Switzerland is preparing for the shutdown of its analog FM radio services as Swiss listeners join the ranks of those in Norway and the United Kingdom who now tune in to DAB+. The nation's switchover from Analog FM to Digital Audio Broadcasting Plus was the subject of discussion at the recent World DAB Summit, a digital radio industry forum held in London in early November. Norway's P4 Radio led the charge in that nation more than five years ago, embracing the multiple channels from one transmitter, a lower-cost way to keep station programming on the air. Switzerland's move comes just as the broadcast licenses for the nation's radio stations expire at the end of 2024. Broadcasters see the switch as a way to save money while increasing the reach and the variety of the program content. There will be no simulcasting on analog FM and digital. In the magazine's article, Swiss broadcaster Nicola Bomio said he worried that the change would cost the station's listenership. Others said they wondered whether listeners living on the border with France would simply tune into stations there. The Board of Trustees of the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame is pleased to announce that Brian Rawlings VE3QN has been named to the Hall of Fame. Radio Amateurs of Canada recognizes deserving amateurs by appointments to the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame. The constitution for the hall specifies that the appointment as member of the hall is made for outstanding achievement and excellence of the highest degree for serious and sustained service to amateur radio in Canada or to amateur radio at large. The trustees of the hall have interpreted the constitution to mean that the person has performed significant service over many years to enhance the well-being of amateur radio. Brian Rawlings was first licensed as VE2AME in Montreal in 1959. Despite long absences from amateur radio while living overseas in Saudi Arabia and Russia, Brian Rawlings has again been an active amateur since 2002 now signing VE3QN from Ottawa. From 2006 until 2020, Brian represented Canadian amateur radio interests as the main RAC contributor to the planning for attendance at the International Telecommunications Union Worldwide Conferences in 2012, 15, and 19. 
This involved not only attendance at the conferences themselves, but also at the national and international meetings in preparation for the conferences. He also played a key role in obtaining support, both nationally and internationally, for amateur-related issues, including successes in gaining amateur access in many countries to frequencies at both 60 and 630 meters. More than 1,000 children are expected to have their moment on the air this year as the 3916 net kicks off its 17th year of the Santa net. When this beloved holiday tradition began 17 years ago, only a handful of youngsters checked in with the assistance of licensed amateur radio operators. If you've been a very good ham this year, you can help a young person be a third-party operator and get that important contact on 3.916 MHz. The net begins on Friday, November 25th at 7.15 p.m. Central Time or 0.115 UTC. Santa will be on the air every night on the same frequency and at that same time until Christmas Eve, December 24th. Just as Santa himself might say, this is a team effort. Organizer Pete Thompson, KE5GGY, said that radio operators who belong to the 3916 net work as relays to ensure everyone gets heard. This is understandably the favorite time of year on 3.916 MHz for these operators. You can even check in before the net at cqsanta.com. That site again, cqsanta.com. Everyone is hoping for good propagation. Meanwhile, if you're unable to reach Santa on HF, he's still reachable by repeater and on Echolink. Santa will be taking calls from November 27th to December 9th thanks to the teamwork of the Longmont Amateur Radio Club and the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club. Linked UHF and VHF repeaters in Colorado will be on the air with Santa, who will be reachable on Echolink node 8305 via the Longmont Club repeater W0ENO-R. We have more on this operation in this report. For the third year in a row, Longmont kids will have the chance to talk to Santa over the radio. The Longmont Amateur Radio Club is once again hosting St. Nick over the waves for this year's Santa on the air. Club president Chuck Pock explained that the idea to let kids talk to Santa via amateur radio came to him in late 2020, when the pandemic meant that both children and Santa would have to avoid crowded places. I knew Santa wouldn't be able to see the kids at the mall or talk to them potentially except maybe by phone or Zoom, Pock said. I figured what's another good method that the kids can talk to Santa and do it in a way that's not common. Amateur radio, also known as ham radio, has been around for over 100 years. Pock, who's been practicing the hobby for eight years, also saw the method as a way to get young people interested in the unique hobby. Santa has done other programs where he's broadcasted on high-frequency radio, but Santa on the air is more localized using repeaters in Longmont. To speak with Santa, children will need to find an amateur radio operator who can connect them directly to him. Pock said he decided to continue the radio program this year for kids and families who might still feel uncomfortable in crowded public places, along with educating children about the benefits and science behind radio. It's a hobby that has to do with the basics, STEM, he said. It's all involved in amateur radio because you have to learn how radio waves work and how different frequencies modulate different ways. This year the Longmont Amateur Radio Club is teaming up with the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club in Fort Collins to provide more opportunities for kids to connect with Santa, and the program will run two weeks instead of one. Potch is hoping at least 100 children will be able to speak with Santa. I'm going to keep doing it right now, until I can't do it anymore or something major happens, he said. Santa will be sending his QSL card to kids who chat with him, which is a type of contact card used in amateur radio that displays a picture with the station's call sign and contact information. The cards will be posted marked from the North Pole, and Santa's station call sign is, of course, N0P. Santa on the Air will run 5 to 7 p.m. on November 27, 6 to 7.30 p.m. November 28 to December 3rd, 5 to 6 p.m. December 4, and 6 to 7.30 p.m. December 5 to December 9. Santa can be reached via repeaters or Echolink. That note again, Echolink node 8305 via the Longmont Club repeater W0ENO-R. Students at Five Bridges Junior High School in Stillwater Lake, Nova Scotia, Canada, finally had an opportunity to talk with an astronaut on board the International Space Station via ham radio. To tell us more about the contact, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters.
On Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022, the students were able to talk to astronaut Josh Casada, KI5CRH, for about 11 minutes as the ISS passed over Northern Europe. The students were anxious to ask questions ranging from curiosities about the astronauts' work schedules to concerns about radiation in outer space. Astronaut Casada was asked about his favorite part of the training for his ISS mission, and he replied, all of it. The contact was made possible with amateur radio volunteers at the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station, Eris Ground Stations in Casale Monteferrara, Italy, using the call sign IK1SLD. And this was the 1,495th contact made since the Eris program began. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. In the United States, Eris includes support from ARRL, AMSAT, NASA, NASA's Space Communication and Navigation Organization, and the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. Through the generous contributions of donors, ARRL exceeded our Giving Tuesday goal, raising over $25,000. This support will extend ARRL's reach to grow and encourage our community of young radio amateurs. Giving Tuesday was November 29, 2022 and is a growing annual movement encouraging individuals and organizations like ARRL to come together to unleash the power of radical generosity. Many ARRL programs and services are not covered by membership fees alone. Contributions have a tremendous impact on ARRL's ability to promote and protect amateur radio and better serve its members. For more information about making a donation to ARRL, please visit www.arrl.org. The Radio Society of Great Britain is devoting the entire month of December to reliving amateur radio history by marking the centenary of the transatlantic tests, which firmly established that amateur radio communications should cross the ocean. The RSGB has activated historic call signs to mark the series of historic moments 100 years ago. The successful one-way transatlantic radio communications show that HF bands can be well-suited for amateur signals crossing an entire ocean. The first amateur transmission from Europe, using the call sign of G5WS, was heard in North America on December 24th of 1922. The RSGB is inviting society members to participate in a month-long celebration by activating a station and is encouraging the rest of the world to listen. The contacts this time will be via two-way communication with awards available to operators logging QSOs with stations using the historic call sign. In England, there are G5WS, G5AT, G6XX, G6ZZ, and G3DR. The station in Scotland will be GM5WS. Wales will be using GW5WS and Northern Ireland G15WS. In the English Channel, operators from the Crown Dependency of Guernsey will be using GU5WS, and those from Jersey will use GJ5WS. Operators from the Isle of Man, another Crown Dependency in the Irish Sea, will be using GD5WS. With the return of the 12 Days of Christmas special event this year, you just can't be sure what those nine drummers, ten pipers, or seven swans are up to, but we do know that hundreds of hams around the world will be listening for them. Their special event call signs will be on the air for a fourth year starting on December 14th and ending on Christmas Day, December 25th. Operators will be using CW and single sideband and also making use of one satellite. As in previous years, they will be using one-by-one -one calls that begin with either a W or a K, but this year, things will be easier for those who wish to rotate their beams. The calls will also contain a stroke and the operator's numerical call area. So get ready to start listening for all those calling birds and earn a downloadable certificate to make the season as bright as those five golden rings. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So if you're at home, the only thing you really, if you control the, in other words, if you control the wireless access point, the base station, the only thing you need to do is turn on WPA2 encryption. 
It's in the router setup. So you go to 192.168.1.1 or whatever it is for your router. You do it in a browser and you'll see right in there, turn on encryption. Turn on WPA2 and give it a password that's not obvious. You know, not your street that you're on or something. But it doesn't have to be the best password ever. But as soon as you've turned that on, all the traffic between your computer and the wireless access point are encrypted. If you control the wireless access point, that's sufficient. I mean, at that point, you're now the internet service provider seeing what you're doing. If you don't trust them, there's more you can do. But you're safe within the environs of your house. Nobody can sit on your curb and spy on you. It's a little more tricky in a coffee shop because you don't control the access point, right? So, right. in fact, most of the time in a coffee shop, they don't use encryption uh, because they don't want to make it hard for you. Sometimes you'll see that. They'll give you a password. You log in. Even then, on an open Wi-Fi access point, the best thing to do if you really want to secure it is to use a VPN, a virtual private network. And there's several ways to do this. The idea of a VPN is uh, if people first became aware of these when they used them at work. So when you work remotely and uh, you want to log on to the network at the office, you're not going to just log on from out, you know, and, and start doing stuff. The office wants to make sure that you are who you say you are and they don't want the conversation you're having with the office servers to be public. So most businesses ran virtual private networks or VPNs. And in the old days, you'd have to put some software in your laptop. You'd have to configure it. It was a real pain, but the IT guy would probably do it. And then you'd run that software. You'd connect to work. And now it's as if you're sitting at your desk. So that was how people first became aware of this. And it turned out it's really good because the traffic is encrypted between you and the VPN server. In this case, it was at your office. At some point, if you're going to surf the internet, the traffic has to kind of emerge onto the public net. So what VPNs do is protect you in the first mile. They protect you at the coffee shop. They protect you from your internet service provider. But at some point, you're going to connect with a server. If you use, you can now use, there's some other ways to do this. You could set up your own VPN server at your house. Many routers have this capability. So then you're at the coffee shop, you're logging into your computer at home and then surfing. It looks like you're coming from your house. Nobody can see anything in between you and your house. That's a good way to do it. That's free. But a lot of people prefer the convenience of a commercial VPN service. You'll be logging into their server and all the data between you and their server is encrypted, but you do at their at that point emerge into the public internet. Now, there are reasons sometimes people prefer this because, for instance, you can have their server be outside the US. You know, sometimes people say, I want to watch the I want to watch the Canadian version of the Olympics. Well, the CBC won't let you do that unless you're coming from Canada. So you might log into a VPN server in Canada. Now, you'll have to judge whether the ethics of this is up to you. I'm not sure what the laws are and so forth, but that's what people often do. It also it can give you privacy as long as the VPN company doesn't log traffic. So you, this, if people want to do this and have more privacy, in other words, not have a, have a law enforcement subpoena against the VPN companies, what was this guy doing? Then you will want to make sure, A, that the company is not in the United States. Many are not. And B, that they don't keep logs, that they don't actually save any information about what you were doing. But that's only that's for people who are more concerned about privacy. If you were if you were in Turkey right now and you were a dissident, you didn't like the premier in Turkey, you would want to cover your tracks. That's a case where you'd use a VPN that did no logging and it was completely private. But for you, you just want to keep the hacker at the coffee shop from seeing what you're up to. VPN works well. I use a little hardware dongle, which I really like. It's called the Tiny Hardware Firewall. You buy it, and you get a year's worth of VPN service from a company called Hotspot VPN. It's kind of cool because it's a little box that you can carry around with you. They actually make one that's just the size of a USB key. You plug in a USB port. It picks up the Wi-Fi, puts it into your computer, but scrambles it. They also make a little box that can use the VPN and Tor, which is an even more private situation. So if you're interested, these are, I think for 99 bucks, this is a really convenient way to do it. No software needed on your computer. Once you configure it, it just kind of works. You just plug it in. And that's the most secure way to use public Wi-Fi, in my opinion. It turns out, I started using these. I put this even on the show for a long time, said, you know... What are you worried about? Your, you know, your Amazon transactions—they're encrypted. 
your Gmail, when you get your mail from Google and most other email providers, that's encrypted. Go to Facebook, that's encrypted now. So you're safe on those things in a public Wi-Fi hotspot. But there are things bad guys who are really motivated can do to attack you, including, for instance, setting up a phony access point, Starbucks 2, and getting you to log into that. The really sneaky trick they do is, okay, so you're sitting there, you're not on a VPN, but you're, you're, you know, you're careful, you're not going anywhere that's not encrypted, you're, you know, using SSL and all that's safe, nobody's seen your credit card or your email password. Nevertheless, the bad guy can set up a little sniffer, one of them's called a pineapple, and he sits there, and he can figure out things like other access points that your computer has joined in the past. Remember, your computer joins access points automatically. Like at your, you get home, your computer's on your Wi-Fi automatically. So he figures out what the name of your home Wi-Fi is, sets up an access point that's stronger than the coffee shops, because it's right next to you, with that name. And your computer goes, oh, I'm home, and joins that. And now you're going, all your traffic is going through him. It's situations like that that are a little nerve-wracking. It's still encrypted, but it's just a little more. He's now on your network, you're on his network. And a VPN eliminates all of this. All the bad guy sees is scrambled data flying through the air. He can't even see which computer it's coming from. So I think that's the way to do it. If, 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 if you're really uh, paranoid, which lately I'm getting more and more so. <laughs> Maybe it's my old age. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? I've been talking for a long time about the FCC and banning robocalls and how they've slow walked this. And it's really, you know, it's really been kind of disappointing that they haven't put the effort into making this work. Well, the deadline, you know, for the robocalling outside the country from companies that don't have a facility, in other words, they don't have a building, passed. And now, yes, the FCC is finally acting. They've cut off a company called Global UC. So according to the FCC, your phone company, whether it's T-Mobile or... Uh, AT&T or Verizon or any of the resellers, U.S. Cellular, uh, any of the MPOs, they have to no longer allow inbound calls from Global UC. The FCC said last month it planned to cut off Global and six other firms that didn't share their anti-robocall strategies. What's your strategy? Despite warnings, commission required that all U.S.-based carriers with IP-based networks use this stir and shake it, this James Bond kind of uh, anti-spoofing measure by the end of June of last year, they told providers to start blocking companies after September 28th of last year once they were not in the robocall mitigation database. Could they make this any more confusing? Anyway, UC Global no longer in the mitigation database, which means, I think, I hope, a cut in robocalls. You tell me if the robocalls uh, are gone or disappear. We shall see, right? Will this work? We've been talking about this a lot. I hope it does. And finally, so you know that Artemis launched the, the Orion capsule, beautiful pictures of the moon. And now if you want, because there is an Amazon Echo up there and an iPad, because those companies gave them lots of money, I can't imagine astronauts really need the Echo. But anyway, it's up there. And the company that put it up there, Lockheed Martin, is now going to give you the chance to send a message to display on the iPad. They'll take a picture of it and send it back to you. Your message in space. Callisto, the Callisto tech demo. There's nobody on this capsule. You know, there's a Snoopy floating around. That's about it. So Lockheed Martin, uh, along with Amazon and the Echo and uh, apparently Cisco WebEx. You know, you gotta think there's some money in there. Oh, just some flowing into the NASA. That's OK. If that's what it took to pay for this trip. OK, you could probably uh, do a Google search for communicate with Callisto, but you could type a message and your name and your email address. And your miss miss message will be shown on the Callisto screen during the mission for the world to see. But don't, they're not, it's not Elon Musk here. They get to approve the messages and they don't want brand advertising. Upon submission, your message will be reviewed and selected for display at the sole discretion of Lockheed Martin. Messages with derogatory, defamatory, racist, sexist, or otherwise inappropriate content will automatically be rejected. Messages that include any copyright materials or endorse any persons, products, brands, etc. will also be automatically rejected. So don't send, you know, happy birthday, mom. Or could you? Maybe you could. I don't know. <laughs> Try it. 
Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. In our last installment, we learned that the UHF spectrum above 25 megacycles, which during the 1930s was populated only by amateurs, was now in the center of a battle being fought on many fronts. Amateurs wanted their 10, 5, 2.5, and 1.25 and meter bands back. Major Edwin Armstrong wanted to increase the 42 to 50 megacycle allocation in the new FM broadcast service. General David Sarnoff of RCA wanted huge chunks of VHF space set aside for television, as well as limited spectrum for FM, a potential rival. And William Paley of CBS wanted UHF, not VHF allocations, for CBS's color wheel TV system, which they wanted the FCC to adopt as the television standard in lieu of RCA's competing system. In addition to these major players, other minor characters were also clamoring for VHF frequencies. The growing aircraft industry, police departments who were tired of the interference-prone 1700 kilocycle police band and wanted to use FM on VHF, and even businesses to whom the idea of personal two-way communication was now possible. Thanks to the war and the introduction of new VHF and UHF tubes, the frequencies above 25 megacycles were now the most sought-after slice of the RF spectrum. During late 1944, the FCC held hearings on post-war VHF allocations in which there were 231 witnesses and 4,200 pages of testimony. In November 1944, the first proposal on VHF-UHF allocations was released. See if you could live with this. From 23.5 to 27 megacycles, industrial applications. From 27 to 29 megacycles, the amateur 11 meter band. You heard me right. From 29 to 43 megacycles, police, fire, emergency, and local government. 43 to 58 megacycles, FM broadcasting. 58 to 60 megacycles, amateur 5 meter band. Note it's only two megacycles wide. 60 to 102 megacycles, TV channels 1 through 7 on the RCA system. 102 to 108 megacycles, non-government emergency. 108 to 132 megacycles, aircraft. 132 to 144 megacycles, government. 144 to 148, amateur 2 meter band. 148 to 152, government. 152 to 218 megacycles was TV channels 8 through 18. Yes, up to channel 18 and again, the RCA system. From 218 to 225 megacycles would be the amateur one and a quarter meter band. 225 to 420 megacycles would be government. 420 to 450 megacycles would be the amateur 70 centimeter band. 450 to 460 megacycles, facsimile broadcasting. And 460 to 956 megacycles, UHF television using the CBS color wheel system. So, under this proposal, our 10-meter band was moved down one megacycle. We would lose one-half of our 5-meter band. We lose 112 through 116 megacycles, but gain 144 through 148. Our one and a quarter meter band stays the same, and we gain a large chunk at 420 megacycles. The FM broadcast allocation is increased by 85%. Police agencies leave the crowded 1700 kilocycle area for VHF-FM. Aircraft has their piece of the pie, and both CBS and RCA have home turfs to battle out the television standards war. Note also the 450 to 460 megacycle range allocated to facsimile broadcasting. For those of you who think fax machines are a recent invention, it may interest you to know that 70 years ago, a reliable mechanical electrical fax system was in use. By the mid-1940s, it was widely believed that every home soon would have a fax machine. During the night as you slept, the machine would be tuned to various stations in the 450 to 460 megacycle range and would print out the next day's newspapers, magazines, and catalogs for you to read in the morning. Another proposal was for a veterans band, 
which would be a 2,000 megacycle wide slice of the spectrum above 10,000 megacycles. This proposed ban would be available for war veterans and only war veterans in any way they desired. The ARRL was quick to object to the proposed allocations. It was not acceptable to amateurs to move our 10 meter band down one megacycle, to eliminate half of five meters, and to upset the harmonic relationship of our bands by moving us up from 112 to 144 megacycles. The FCC capitulated on 10 and 5 meters, as we will see in a moment. As for the 144 to 148 megacycle band, the FCC was firm. 112 through 116 megacycles was going to aircraft. Furthermore, the FCC wanted our amateur bands above 100 megacycles to be next to government allocations so that in the time of war or national emergency, they could be used for the expansion of essential government radio services. The needs of the government per the FCC outweighed the need for a strict harmonic relationship between the amateur bands. Meanwhile, while the ARRL was arguing over our allocations, General Sarnoff was conducting his campaign behind the scenes. He couldn't eliminate the CBS color wheel UHF system because, at that time, CBS was producing beautiful, lifelike color pictures that impressed the FCC. But he could attack FM. A big deal was made out of the claim that FM broadcasting needed to be moved higher in the VHF range to eliminate interference caused by sporadic e-skip. Sarnoff, of course, wanted these frequencies for TV. He never explained, and no one seemed to ask, how TV would not be affected. In fact, TV, with its amplitude-modulated video signal, would be more susceptible to e-skip than FM with its capture effect. RCA, however, had the power, the money, and the influence, and Major Armstrong found he was no match for the corporate giant. On January 15, 1945, the FCC issued a revised allocation proposal. Here it is. 25 to 28 megacycles, fixed, mobile, industrial, scientific, and medical. 28 to 30 megacycles, amateur 10 meter band. 30 to 44 megacycles, police, fire, and various government allocations. 44 to 50 megacycles, TV channel one. Now you know where it was. 50 to 54 was our amateur 6 meter band, 54 to 84 was TV channels 2 through 6, 84 to 102 was FM broadcasting, 102 to 108 was possible facsimile broadcasting, 108 to 132 was aircraft, 132 to 144 was government, 144 to 148 amateur 2 meter band, 148 to 152 was government. Note how 2 meters is sandwiched in between the two government bands. From 152 to 162 megacycles, police, fire, and other local government. 162 to 170 megacycles, government. 170 to 180 megacycles, navigational aids. 180 through 216 megacycles was TV channels 7 through 12. Note that TV only gets 12 VHF channels in this proposal. 216 to 220 is government, 220 to 225 is the amateur one and a quarter meter band, 225 to 420 government including military aircraft, 420 to 450 is the amateur 70 centimeter band, 450 to 460 megacycles, air navigation, 460 to 470 megacycles, a new citizens band, which eventually would evolve into class A and class B C B, and then into GMRS and then FRS. 470 to 480 megacycles was facsimile broadcasting, and 480 to 940 megacycles was experimental TV for the CBS color wheel system. Yes, this proposal sounds a lot like what we have today, but the battle was only beginning. Major Armstrong was not giving up on an FM band in the 43 to 58 megacycle area. He didn't want the thousands of FM receivers and dozens of stations now on the air to suddenly become obsolete. CBS was still convinced that UHF was the place for TV and that their system was the best. During the first half of 1945, the battle would rage with many more proposals to come forth. Join us next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives continues to watch this epic battle. T'was the night before Christmas when all through the town the snowstorm was raging, the phone lines were down, the wind it did howl, the tree limbs did crack, 
I hope that St. Nick isn't forced to turn back. The wife's making cookies, the kid's making noise. While away at the shack, by my rig I was poised. The finals were glowing, the mic gain was set. I was chasing DX to see what I could get. The bands were all empty, the frequencies clear, except one lone station that sounded quite near. He was calling CQ in my interested peak when he ended transmission with the words, Old Saint Nick. I answered back quickly, I used great dispatch. If this were St. Nicholas, good God, what a catch. We exchanged information, it was really quite graphic. Then he came back and said, I have emergency traffic. His reindeer were tired, his elves in a grump. If he didn't land soon, then his sleigh he would dump. I thought very carefully, I thought very hard. Then I gave him directions to my snow-covered yard. As he flew past my window, his hair in a mane, he reined in his chargers and called them by name. Woe anode, woe cathode, woe zener, woe diode. Stop heater, stop grid leak, stop bias, stop triode. You're flying too low, you're flying too fast. Look out, you dumb reindeer, it's his antenna mast. So into the backyard the reindeer did drop. St. Nick, the elves, and the sleigh went kerplop. Then at the back door I heard this loud knocking. Open up in there, or I won't fill your stocking. As I turned off the light and was leaving the shack, into the house St. Nicholas came from the back. His two-meter rig held to his hip with a strap. Hams do it on the shack, on the front of his cap. The sack that he carried made his age brow furrow, and he handed me a card that read, QSL via Bureau. His clothes were all sooty, from his shoes to his vest. I felt like a novice taking his test. His fingers were calloused, and from what I could tell, it came from a straight key I bet he used well. I offered him coffee. I offered him smokes. I tried easing the tension by telling ham jokes. Then he nodded his head and raised up his thumb. He smiled like an Elmer. Boy, did I feel dumb. He grabbed up his sack and went straight for the tree and placed in it a large present for me. When he finished his work, he stood up, took a bow. Then out the back door to his team he did plow. But I heard him exclaim as he flew o'er the land, Beware of the FCC, friend. We're both out of band. Foundations of Amateur Radio It's common knowledge that power, as in output power, makes a signal heard in more places. If you followed my adventures, you'll also know that I'm a firm believer in low power, or QRP, operation. It all started when I was told that my shiny new amateur license was rubbish because I was only allowed to use 10 watts. Seemingly, the whole community around me shared that opinion, and slogans like Life's too short for QRP are still commonly heard. As a direct result of that sentiment, I decided to explore and document just how much I could actually do with my so-called introductory license, the Australian Foundation license. I've now held it for over a decade and I'm still exploring and writing. One of my first acts of rebellion was to lower my radio output power to its minimum setting of 5 watts, and half-legal power was sufficient to prove my point. Although I'm still regularly being encouraged to upgrade, my second act of defiance is to keep my foundation license until I decide that I need more. I'll let you know if it ever happens. One more well-known so-called fact about our hobby is that if you use low power, you'll really only get anywhere on the higher bands, 2 meters, 70 centimeters and above. There's plenty of reports of amateurs using a low power handheld radio to talk to the International Space Station, and my own satellite internet used 1 watt to get to geostationary orbit. On HF, on the other hand, 5 watts is as low as you really want to go. Making contact is a struggle and often frustrating, but when you do, bliss. About a year ago, I took delivery of a whisper beacon. It's capable of transmitting on all my accessible HF bands using 200 milliwatts. Given my antenna situation, I've configured it to transmit on the 10 meter band, 24 hours a day, thunderstorms accepted. When making the purchase decision, I had no insight into how my beacon would perform. 200 milliwatts is stretching even my love of low power, but I hooked it up and turned it on, and waited. 
It came as quite a surprise that my beacon was heard over 15,000 kilometres away. Not once, not a couple of times, but regularly. When I came up with my November challenge to see if I could improve on that, I made an almost throwaway comment about reducing power to see if I could still make the distance. A couple of weeks ago, I hooked up a 6 dB attenuator to my beacon, reducing the power from 200 down to 50 milliwatts. It came as quite a surprise that my signal made it to the same receiver in the Canary Islands. My kilometre per watt calculation shot up, quadrupling my previous record. Just imagine, 50 milliwatts making its way over a third of the way around the globe, bouncing between the ionosphere and the planet, just like any other HF signal. At that point, I realised I had learned a few things. You don't need stupid power to make a distant contact on HF either. I started wondering just how little power was needed to get out of the shack. Yesterday I hooked up a 10 dB attenuator and within 10 hours my now 20 milliwatt beacon broke my own kilometer per watt record again, and based on the signal to noise numbers from previous contacts, I see no reason for that record to stand for very long. Once that happens I've got plenty more attenuators to play with, and I'm not afraid to use them. Now I'm on the hunt for an attenuator that will reduce my main radio output from 5 watts. I'm told I should aim for double the power rating, but I also have to consider how to connect my antenna coupler which needs 10 watts to tune. But that's a project for another day. When was the last time that you used really low power? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Amateurs who hold a full license in the United Kingdom will be eligible to use the frequencies between 146 to 147 megahertz after receiving a notice of variation from Ofcom. In some restricted areas, operational limitations exist. The notice is available on a temporary basis only and is subject to a 30-day notice period that is being changed or withdrawn. By making this part of the spectrum available, Ofcom is hoping to encourage experimentation by radio amateurs, allowing them to experiment with new technologies such as digital voice and data transmissions having moderate bandwidth. Ofcom defines moderate as being up to 500 kilohertz wide. The one year notice of variation was first made to full licensees in October 2014. The Radio Society of Great Britain said that it is pleased that Ofcom has accepted its latest request to extend the agreement. NOV applications are made via the Radio Society of Great Britain website, rsgb.org slash NOV. Young amateur radio operators in North, Central, and South America are being invited to plan for a memorable time in Canada this coming July. Applications are now open for the third Youth on the Air camp, which is open to licensed radio amateurs between the age of 15 and 25. The camp will be held on the campus of the Carleton University in Ontario, Canada from July 16th through July 21st. The application process is free and allocations are being held for campers from each of the three Americas to allow for attendance from countries throughout the International Amateur Radio Union region too. For the best chances of being chosen, prospective campers are being encouraged to apply by January 15th. The application process will, however, continue through May 31st. To apply and to read details about making separate arrangements for transportation, visit the Youth on the Air, all one word, dot org. It is time for this week's Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that no new sunspots appeared over the past reporting week, November 24th through the 30th. But sunspots were visible every day. Then on December 1st, three new sunspot groups emerged. The sunspot number rose from 12 to 49, and the total sunspot area went from 10 to 330. Sunspot numbers and solar flux declined during this reporting week, again November 24th to the 30th, with average daily sunspot numbers dropping from 66 to 46, and the average daily solar flux from 116.5 to 108.3. Solar wind streams from coronal holes kept geomagnetic indicators active with average daily planetary A indices jumping from 5.1 to 18.6 and the middle latitude A index went from 3.4 to 14. On Wednesday, November 30th, the magnetometer at Fairbanks, Alaska showed the College A index at 54, the highest value over the past month. 
No doubt this produced Aurora. The next day, the disturbance continued with the College A index at 51. These are very large numbers. The current prediction from Thursday night has solar flux reaching a peak of 130 this weekend, rather than the previously reported 135. We might also see solar flux below 100 around Christmas Eve. Look for flux values of 130 on December 4th and 5th, 125 on December 6th and 7th, then 120, 125, 125, 130, 115, and 110 on December 8th all the way through the 13th, 105 on December 14th and 17th. Taking a look at the Planetary A Index, the prediction is 18 and 12 on December 4th and 5th, 5 on December 6th and 7th, 10 and 8 on December 8th and 9th, 5 on December 10th through the 16th, and 10 on December 17th and 18th. Just ahead in radio sport contesting uh, for this week, on December 2nd, a couple of uh, opportunities. The K1USN slow speed test, that is CW. And December 2nd through the 4th, the ARRL 160 meter contest, that's CW there. On December 3rd, uh, three opportunities. The Wake Up QRP Sprint, that's CW. December 3rd and 4th, that's the Pro CW Contest, CW as well there. And on December 3rd and 4th, the FT Roundup, that's uh, digital, of course. On December 1st, the K1USN Slow Speed Test, CW there. On December 6th, the 50 Worldwide Sideband Activity Contest, that's phone. And on December 6th, the ARS Spartan Sprint, that's CW. And on December 6th, the RTT Ops Week Sprint, that of course is digital. And some upcoming section state and division conventions on December 9th and 10th, the Tampa Bay Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL West Central Florida Section Convention, that's in Plant City, Florida. January 7th, the Ham Radio University, hosting the ARRL New York City Long Island Section Convention, that is an online event. And on January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Section Convention, that is in Fort Myers, Florida. A new D expedition is coming up for older amateurs. The South Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu isn't exactly roughing it. There's a power grid, commercial airspace, homes to rent, and a population of more than 40,000 people. For a group of adventurous amateurs with the average age of 70, that makes it a great spot for a D expedition. Van Herridge, N4VGE, is a born traveler, and though he calls South Carolina home, he's always looking for adventure beyond his home. Now, he and a group of older amateurs will follow that roving spirit to Vanuatu in the South Pacific. The group has planned a two-week D expedition in December of 2024, and it will include participation in that year's ARRL 10-meter contest. The men are bringing all the necessary equipment and are also bringing their wives, because the, this DX has hotels, restaurants, beaches, and other attractions to make it a family holiday. DXers already know that Vanuatu ranks 100th on the DXCC list of 340 countries. For this team, however, it ranks number one as a good spot to aim for more than 50,000 QSOs using CW, single sideband, RIDI, and FT8. They are looking for four more radio operators inviting them to bring their spouses to make this a great team. Van asks that interested D expeditioners contact them at Van Herridge, that's V A N. H E R R I D G at gmail.com. Meanwhile, the team also is working on developing a website and seeking sponsors. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP on the Rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. These days, more and more people are deciding to take the train instead of flying the crowded skies. With their cramped, uncomfortable seats, crazy drunk people, or being treated like a criminal at the airport. This becomes especially true when people realize that the trip itself can also become a part of the destination. At the airport and on the airplane, using electronics like a GPS, VHF scanners, and sometimes even your laptop computer can be forbidden or even seized. So what about using ham radio or other wireless electronics on board a long distance passenger train? You can probably visualize that modern passenger rail cars are highly electronic and operate many high amperage AC circuits inside. On the outside, trains often share the rail right of way with very high voltage noisy power lines running alongside the tracks mile after mile. The RF environment inside the Amtrak cars tends to be as noisy as inside any modern day American home. 
These grounded stainless steel train cars attenuate outside signals and serve as directional barriers to RF and can also tend to keep radio noise safely inside the car. But I was still able to listen to AM and FM broadcasts with my tiny HT, and I could work two meters simplex and some repeaters just fine from inside the sleeper car. The modern Amtrak cars are often two stories tall, which gives you a definite height advantage over working from your car. Using my tiny HT as a scanner worked better than I expected. Rail companies in the USA have their own band from 159 to 162 megahertz, divided into about 100 channels every 15 kilohertz. They use analog narrow FM for voice and also some telemetry beacons. They also use a special gear on higher bands like 220.1 and 452 megahertz and in the realm of cellular from 826 to 928 megahertz but most of these are for data and telemetry on a recent amtrak trip i found most of the crew using fm handhelds most of the larger rail stations used fm simplex following the same channel schemes i found online you can program all 100 rail channels into your ht and follow most of their voice traffic listening to the dispatchers at the larger stations provided a good source of information about work being done on the train cars causes of delays or possible traffic conflicts up ahead rail employees have their jargon just like in aviation and it was interesting to hear them use the readback method to make sure that instructions from the dispatchers were correctly received. Amtrak does not own the tracks they run on, but shares them with the host freight company that actually own and maintain the rails, which means passenger service sometimes has to park and wait for the freight traffic to clear. This also means Amtrak is operating a passenger service on a rail network designed for freight trains who probably don't care about how smooth or quiet the ride is. It also means that delays are generally well communicated by radio from the conductor to the dispatchers on one of those 100 VHF channels. So you'll be well informed about the delays and that most commonly asked question, how long till we get there? On my two and a half day rail adventure, I was the only passenger that knew the actual cause of some of our delays, which are common for Amtrak service, so they're very upfront about them. If you search online for Amtrak radio channels, you'll find lots of resources, lists of channels, and what frequencies the dispatchers use. It's well worth the time and easy to program into your handheld using programming software on your computer, like my little Yaesu HT that ran the entire 2200 mile trip on just three AA batteries. There is one caveat I'd like to offer people intending to ride our U.S. passenger rail carriers about an interesting thing I discovered this winter while riding on the Texas Eagle line from Los Angeles to San Antonio and then north to Chicago. Our train stopped in El Paso, Texas for about an hour. I grabbed my cell phone to text my location to relatives and got a text message bounced back advising me I was accessing a Mexican cellular company. It said I should text back a particular code to avoid being billed at an astoundingly high rate. I didn't fall for that trick and my text was never sent, but the lesson learned is whenever you're near the U.S. border, be careful when using your cell phone or even your HT. You may have been switched to a foreign cell company with huge data and text rates without any warning. And in some areas along our border, transmitting on 2 meters or UHF may also not even be allowed. The El Paso train station is just a couple hundred feet from our border with Mexico. My best advice is to put your cell phone in airplane mode when you're near the Amtrak station in downtown El Paso, Texas. In our next episode, we'll cover using your HT on the train. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP from Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Bears of Manchester Amateur Radio Club in Manchester, Connecticut, spent Thanksgiving Day providing amateur radio communications support for the 86th Manchester Road Race. For more details, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ. That race is a 4.7-mile course. It begins and ends on Main Street in downtown Manchester and has been a Thanksgiving Day tradition since 1927. This is the 30th consecutive year the Bears of Manchester Amateur Radio Club has provided communication support with more than 10,000 runners participating and over 30,000 spectators lining the course. Radio operators began arriving at 6 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning. 55 operators staffed 39 positions around the course and were stationed every quarter mile to provide safety communications and report the lead male and female runners to the public address announcer. Shadow operators helped 10 race officials stay in communications. 
Operators also started and ran four clocks around the course to help pace runners. And a station operated in the Public Safety Emergency Operations Center to relay safety-related information to representatives of various agencies. Ham radio operators also provided communications for a shuttle bus operation that brought runners and spectators from a remote parking lot to the Main Street area and then returned them at the end of the race course. Check-in and check-out were accomplished through a net control station to maintain accountability. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Communication for the event was made on six repeater and simplex frequencies, and three cross-band repeaters were used for signal quality to avoid interference. The Bears of Manchester Amateur Radio Club is an ARRL affiliated club. Here are a few amateur radio satellite related news items from across the globe. The newly renovated West Wing of the National Air and Space Museum at the Downtown Mall recently opened to the public. The new One World Connected exhibit shows how aviation and spaceflight transformed how Earth came to be viewed and understood as an interconnected world. One World Connected tells the story of how taking to the skies and stars fostered two momentous changes in everyday life. The ease in making connections across vast distances and new perspectives of Earth as humanity's home. Featuring an array of satellites and other tools that have increased human connection, the exhibition asks visitors to consider how global interconnection touches their lives and to imagine how advances in technology might impact our near future. Scale models of OSCAR-1 and Microsat are on display in the exhibit. NASA and the Government of Japan on Thursday announced further contributions by Japan to Gateway, a key component to the agency's Artemis mission for long-term lunar exploration. In addition to the Gateway arrangement, Minister Nagaoka announced Japan's commitment to participate in the International Space Station program through 2030 the first international partner to join the United States in formally committing to space station operations through 2030. NASA welcomed Japan's announcement of its continuation of the space station operations through 2030. NASA and its international partners conduct critical science, research, and technology demonstrations aboard the orbiting laboratory that make long-duration missions to the Gateway and the Moon possible. During September 26th through the 30th, the new GNU Radio Conference 2022 was held in Washington, D.C. New Radio Conference is the annual conference centered around the new radio project and community and is one of the premier software-defined radio industry events. New Radio is an open-source digital signals processing tool which is often used with SDRs. A few days ago, videos of all the presentations were released on their YouTube channels. The videos contain a mix of in-person and remote talk. A schedule of all talks can be found on the new radio website, https colon forward slash forward slash events dot g-n-u-r-a-d-i-o dot org. Dr. Christina Collins, KD8OXT, earned her Ph.D. in electrical engineering from Case Western Reserve University on November 18, 2022. Dr. Collins's thesis, Development of a Low-Cost Meta Instrument for Distributed Observations of Ionospheric Variability, focuses on the development of the HAMSI GRAPE Personal Space Weather Station Network. HAM Radio Science Citizen Investigation, or HAMSI, serves as a means for fostering collaborations between professional researchers and amateur radio operators. Dr. Collins currently serves on the HAMSI Advisory Board, leads the HAMSI Eclipse and Frequency Measurement Festivals Project and WWVH Scientific Modulation Team and served as chair of the local organizing committee for the 2019 HAMSI Workshop. She has been interviewed on the AWRL's Eclectic Tech Podcast and has peer-reviewed papers published in the American Geophysical Union's EOS Magazine and the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Letters. She is excited to be joining the Space Science Institute in the spring of 2023 as a postdoctoral research fellow through the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs. Dr. Collins was first licensed in 2010 and now holds an amateur extra class license. Members of the Starfleet Amateur Radio Club, the National Institute for Amateur Radio, Indian Institute of Hams, West Bengal Radio Club, 
and the Indian Academy of Communication and Disaster Management were among the hundreds of amateurs across India watching eagerly on Saturday, November 26th, as an Indian Space Research Organization mission lifted off from the Satish Dhawan Space Center. Although the primary payload was an ocean observable satellite, the varied secondary payload also included two satellites that Indian news media were praising as the nation's first homegrown amateur satellites to be launched aboard an Indian space vehicle. The nano satellites had been built in Hyderabad by Dhruva Space, founded by four radio amateurs 10 years ago. The CubeSats have a combined mass of 1.45 kilograms and each is no longer than 10 by 10 by 5 centimeters. HAMS will be able to use their store and forward messaging system. Druva's chief executive officer, Sanjay Nakanti, AB3OE VU3ISS, told one news outlet that this mission was extremely important to those who designed and built the satellites and said the HAMS will be testing them out following their deployment into low Earth orbit. Sanjay went on to say that this is a way for us to give back to the ecosystem. He said he hoped the mission would also encourage more people to get involved in amateur radio and the sciences. And finally this week, how is radio actually doing in the car today, given growing competition from streaming services? What motivates people to choose radio over streaming while driving and vice versa? And what role will voice control play in managing in-car entertainment systems? These points and others were covered by Diana Franganillo, Director of In-Vehicle UX Research at Strategy Analytics during her presentation talk at the World DAB Summit 2022. Diana touched on the growing availability of DAB receivers in cars, the need for automobile manufacturers to provide drivers with easy-to-read, easy-to-navigate touch panels, and the emergence of Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, and the Android Automotive Operating System in this environment. The next trend I will mention is the ubiquity of voice interactions, she continued. If well implemented, they could be less distracting to drivers than manual visual interactions. And the last trend, of course, to be prepared for is autonomous vehicles. All this being said, there is still a clear and very specific need for broadcast radio in the car, she concluded. While it is true that the time spent listening to streaming sources has increased, these services are complementary to radio. This is why, in her view, radio is still royalty on vehicle dashboards. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI, on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesk in Brunswick, New York. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, 
the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.